Funny, I thought I was loud enough, and then the microphone, it really helps out, but um, uh, we are, I wanted to keep you guys sort of up on what's going on, uh, how to help you guys out. There's some seats up front here, everybody's like, this is like the splash zone, Uh, they're like, I can't go up front, no, no, but now you're an illustration for the sermon, Julie, it's nice to have you today. (laughs) No, but seriously. Um, So I wanted a couple of things I wanted to do today. One of them is I wanted to let you know uh, one of the things that we do, if we got a picture here, go into the first picture, there we go. This picture here, uh, we we support one church, one church plant, somebody supported us at the very beginning. Um, This is uh, Canvas Church, and that's the senior pastor Kevin there. They are one year old, and you guys have been able to to help support them financially. Uh, we've been praying for them as a staff. He, he's come over. He preached here last year. And I wanted to keep you guys up on what's going on and where your finances are going. For some of you, you're like, hey, I'm giving to the church. What in the heck happens with all the money from the church? You should ask those questions. Those are good questions to be asked. And one of the things that we do is we support a church plant. They had this past year, or I guess this past year, they had 25 baptisms, which we're crazy excited about that we could be a part of, that we could help over in Goldsboro. Goldsboro. There we go. All two of you know where Goldsboro is. There are Goldsboro representatives. I know. That's nice, right? Kevin's over there. He's trying to tell all of your old high school friends that like, you need Jesus. Yeah, Yeah, exactly right. Um, But one of the things, like some of you guys have been with us for a long time, some of you guys haven't. He recorded this. They have run 52,800 feet of cords, eight miles of cords. They've laid out 16,800 plastic partitions. That's 56 football fields. They have given away 2,500 cups of coffee um, just to let you guys know what's going on. And we have been able to be a part of this as we're able to help finance them because the last thing when they told me at the church plant uh, when I started, the last thing that comes in is somebody's finances, right? Like, so if you're reaching people who don't know Jesus, they're like, I don't know about this place. I don't know that I'm going to trust them with my money, which is okay. Like, that's not a horrible thing. So you have to have somebody who can prop you up financially and say, okay, we're going to help you out. So he went and he found some partners and said, okay, normally for the first three years, can you help us out financially? By then they should be on their feet and they should be going. So he's been doing that. We're crazy excited for Kevin and Canvas and what they're doing out there. So I wanted to keep you guys up on what's going on there because I heard this. I heard this from a friend of mine. Bobby Davis told me this. He heard it from just a fantastic man. Uh, So I'm going to steal it because it's good because following Jesus is free and ministry is not. It's just how it is. It's just how it is, right? Like we're able to sit in here today. We're able to sit. Like we paid for the chairs. We're paying for the electricity, the lights, the staff, the everything that's going on. Missions, both local like Canvas and then also overseas like we did with one child. And then we do with uh, the Bill Walks who are over in Bosnia. Like, there's a lot of things this goes on to, and thank you guys for being generous with your finances. If you haven't been generous with your finances, how about you give it a try? That's always fun. Like, that's just, that's just uh, let me throw that out there, because that's fun for me. But every year in the fall, what we try doing is we try reminding people of who we are at our core. And that's where this sermon series has come from. The sermon series talking about staying the course. Some of you are on this course, and you want to be a disciple maker, and you want to figure out how to do that, you want to be a part of a church that does that, some of you are like, I don't know anything about this. These are just seven essential practices, some activities that you can take that will help you get closer to Jesus and understand him. So this is one of the things, and we are on uh, chasing the strays today. We've talked about how to abide in Christ, and the difference between abiding in Christ and sort of just staying in Christ. Like, I can stay somewhere because I'm stubborn. I'm bullheaded. Like, you ain't making me leave because... Uh Uh-uh, like I'm doing better than you. But when you abide, there's something different. There's something about finding joy there and and receiving something that God has for you. Reaching the lost. Um, This is where we talked about, uh, where we went into one child and we're talking about, we want to introduce the world to the real Jesus one person at a time. How does that happen unless we partner with people other places, unless some of us go other places? So we need to be reaching the lost everywhere. Last week, Richie talked about connecting the unconnected. 
The people who just haven't got in, who, who just haven't met Jesus, who just haven't met you guys, like we do this through connection groups, and just being nice to people and saying hi when they walk in, whatever it might be, and we are uh, connecting the unconnected. This week we're talking about chasing the strays, and this one I have really learned a lot about in the past. I've lived out some things that I've learned in the past year, and it is crazy um, about what's going on with this. Like, I changed some stuff this morning, so it's like, okay, let's see how this goes. We're going to have some fun with this. Um, But one of the things that we have to do is to be this disciple-making church, we have to decide that we are going to be a disciple-making church. So why is Catalyst a disciple-making church? And here's the reason. Like, everybody needs to hear this. This church does not belong to you. This church does not belong to me. This church belongs to Jesus. And Jesus said, I will, start, I will build my church upon this rock, where he's talking to Peter there. Um, and he is the one who started church. So, so people who are saying, well, I, I, you know, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Sort of a hard thing to do. Like, I'm sure you've been to church, you've been burned. And somebody uh, did something or said something that maybe wasn't very nice. But that's just one place or one person. It's not the church international. So give something else another try. Um, If Catalyst isn't your place, that's fine. Like there is some place, I believe, for everybody. But we've got to realize this because the church doesn't belong to you or me. Scripture says that we need to be a disciple-making church. If we are following Jesus, then we are making disciples. We don't have a choice in the matter. When you give your life to Jesus, there are some choices that go out the window. You don't get choices anymore. And there are some things you have to do that you're like, I'm not really happy with those things. And there are some things you have to quit doing that you've practiced becoming good at for a long time that you're like, I just figured this out. Okay, I have to stop that now. And it doesn't, like, sometimes Jesus takes it away, and sometimes it's like, I've got to work on this and fight against this every day. So it's crazy. But in Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 through 18, there's a lot of things. Like, I could spend three days on the scriptures that we have today. I'm not going to because you guys want to get out of here and eat lunch and it should be good and hang out with your family. But in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has called everybody out and he has said, okay, who do you say that I am? And they say, well, these people say that you're this person, you're Elijah, you're this person or that person. He said, I don't care about them. Who do you say that I am? And Jesus replied, uh, and Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, there's no way that you could know that except for God told you that. And then we pick up in verse 17, and he says, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome this. So this is where the Catholic people, uh, you grew up in Catholic church, this is where they get the idea for the first pope. Because he's saying, on this rock, on Peter, which does mean rock, I will build my church. I think what he's saying is on this statement that Jesus is the son of Christ, I will build my church. And he's saying, um, and I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome this. This seemed like an action, right? Like we should be kicking in the doors and going in and taking names, like bringing people back uh, into relationship with Jesus, but we're not doing this. And we're not doing this. We're not overcoming the gates of Hades because there is not a single county in the United States where Christianity is on the rise. Not a single county. And it's like, how's it? but we've got all these churches and all these big churches. There are like seven churches a day closing every single day. We just don't see them. Like you drive past them and you're like, oh, when, that seems like a church. You don't know if it's open until you drive in there on Sunday, right? Like there are all of these things closing and we just don't recognize that like, We were built to win as the church of Jesus, and we're not winning. And that's because a lot of churches aren't Jesus' church. They are the pastor's church. They are the people's church. They are the community church. They are the whatever it might be. But if you are Jesus' church, like, we have to go do what we're doing. So uh, this is why it's important to understand that this is why Catalyst makes disciples, and we do this through relationships. So to do that... You're going to have these times where people will come in, and this, like, this applies to your life. I'm going to talk about how it applies to the church a little bit today. But people will come in, something will happen, and they will not be here. We have been around for 13 years. We couldn't fit all the people in this room with everybody who has come to Catalyst at one point. 
Some people come into a church. Some people leave a church. What is the church supposed to do about that? What are the members supposed to do about that? What is God supposed to do about that? That's what we're going to look into today because he gives us an idea, an outline on how to handle this if we do this right. And that is called chasing the strays. And as we look at this, I want to understand this. So one of the things that we talk about here at Catalyst often is there's God's part, there's your part, and there's my part. And we're going to talk about those three things a little bit today. And to understand this, we have to realize that church is a team sport. I am not the only paid player. Well, that, that's the pastor job. That's the pastor job. That's the pastor job. It's just like, I'm not good at all that many things. I don't like it. Made, does, those of you who have spent some time with me, you're like, that is true. He's not very good at many things. Like, that's fine. So that's why he put all of us together in a room, because I believe all of us who are here can take care of everything. But my job is not to do everything. Maybe it's to help make sure things get done. So we need to realize that the church is a team sport. And today I'm going to pull back the curtain on what we do to chase the strays and to be a relational church. One of the things that we do, if somebody got a bulletin, we had a good bulletin hander outer today. We got bulletins there. We have inside of those green connection cards. There's a reason we call them connection cards because we want to connect with you. On the back of the seats in front of you, you'll see these little QR codes. This is where we know whether you are here or not. Now, you're not getting a gold star if you were here every week, and we're not beating you over the head with a bat if you're not here one week. But what we do here at Catalyst is we chase the strays. To do this, what we have to do is we have to know whether you're here or not. If you're not here for two weeks in a row, Kathy and I go through this every week, if you're not here for two weeks in a row, you'll get a text or a phone call. If you're in a connection group, we'll go to your connection group leader and say, hey, uh, you know, Brian and Kathy haven't been here. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're on vacation. They're good. I kept up with them. It was like, fantastic. Or something bad's going on in their family. Well, we need to reach out. What's going on with them? If you're not in a connection group, that's where you'll get one of the staff members or something like that to reach out to you. Now, here's one of the things that we used to do. We used to make phone calls all the time. And I would make these phone calls and say, hey, I just want to let you know that we missed you this week. And they were like, well, you know, I was on vacation, and my mom came in, and then we did this. And it's like, I, I don't mean to be a jerk. It's just natural for me sometimes. But here's the thing. I don't care why you weren't here. I just wanted to let you know that we're not the same without you. Like, we just miss you. Like, that is between you and your family and God and whatever it is. I just wanted to let you know when you're not here, we're not as good. Like, we like you being around. So we started texting people. Hey, I just want to let you know we missed you. We're not the same without you, whatever it might be. And we're going to talk about this, and you can just copy what we do later on. But um, here in John chapter 6, we realize we start looking at God's part, right? I jumped ahead. We start looking at God's part. So it says in John chapter 6, verse 44, No one can come to me, the Father, unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus is saying here, no one can come to me unless the Father calls their name. If you're like, why am I in church today? It's because the Father called your name. And maybe they're doing it through a friend, a spouse, like, I just feel like maybe I should go today. I don't know, like there's something inside of me that just doesn't make sense. I, I don't get it or whatever. That's the Holy Spirit working. He is calling people. It's not because of the fantastic preaching. It's not because of the excellent worship we have. It's not because of whatever it is. It's because God is starting to call you. That's God's job. It's not my job to call you to every church. Now I'll invite you and I hope that you show up. And it's not my job to change your heart. That's God's job. Like he figures that out. And we see that in John chapter 16, verse 8. This talking about the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will prove to the world uh, to be, the, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So when you start like um, making poor decisions, when you start living lives and doing things that shouldn't be done, you're going to start feeling a certain way. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you. If you do it long enough, you become numb to that feeling, and you're like, maybe the, maybe the Holy Spirit's fine with me going out and just you know, beating people in the streets every night of the week. No is the answer to that, like, but you've done it so often that it's like, I become sort of numb to how I used to feel when I first started missing, when I first started making these decisions, when I first started putting something else in priority above God, and you just get used to it. 
But God's job is to call you. God's job is to convict your heart, to change, to let you know when you make a bad decision, to help you move forward. That's God's job. Now, I want to say this, like, this is your job, not just my job, your job, and I just talked about what the church does with this, your job is to make sure that when somebody is not here, you reach out to them, let them know they're missed. Just that simple. If you are a connection group leader, we know that you are responsible for everybody in your connection group. So is also everybody in the connection group. If you're in here today and you're like, so-and-so always sits next to me because we always sit in the same seats. These guys are really uncomfortable because they're up front right now. Like, we tried moving people over here because everybody wants to stop in the first two sections. They're like, we're running out of chairs. We're not. They're just over here and nobody wants to come over here normally. So it's like, okay, we do have some space, but we all like to sit in the same place. If you see someone's missing after a couple of weeks, text them, call them. Just want to say, hey, we missed you. You good? Now I had something happen in my family. Can I do something? Can we help out? Like, jump in there because this is your church. Like, this is, well, this is Jesus' church, but it's our job to keep up with the church, right? Like, we are the family. We are the body. We need to take care of each other. So if you are uh, normally in a connection group, men's breakfast on Friday morning, and somebody's missing, let them know you missed them. Like, and, and steal what I do until you figure out your own. Hey, I just wanted to let you know we missed you. It's not the same without you. Not like, why weren't you here? You need to be here all the time and all of, you know, just don't, don't be that person. But it is your job, not my job, to reach out to people who you recognize that are missing. Because if you recognize it, God put it on your heart. I don't always recognize that. So, so that's one piece here. The other piece is there are some of you here that are like, okay, well, probably all of us here have fa family members who don't know Jesus. They don't have the relationship with Jesus. And you're just like, I'm praying for him, and I want him to happen, and I want him to come, and I want him, what am I supposed to do about this? God's job is to call them. God's job is to convict them. It isn't your job to say, you know, just kick down their door every day and let them know what they're doing wrong and how they're messing up their life. Like, that never helps anything. Try not doing that. But if you have a brother, a sister, some kids that have walked away that don't know Jesus, maybe they were raised in your house and you're like, I don't even know what to do with them anymore. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11, it says, For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will look after them. There is no one that loves your kids, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, more than God himself. And he said, I will seek them out, and I will look after them. Hopefully that brings you a little bit of peace, knowing that God's already got this under control. He knows where they are. He knows where they are in their heart. He knows what's going on. And he's already watching over them. So we got to keep that in mind that like God wants to take care of this. He's already doing this. And we see in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to, came to seek and save the lost. It's like, okay, like I've been needing some help here. You know, it's really hard. Uh, me, being, me being a preacher, it's like, okay, I've got two brothers. They don't go to church. My mom has started to come to church, which is great. But, like, I'm Scott. I'm, I'm not the preacher to them. Like, it's just, mm -mm, don't, don't be bringing that mess over here. Don't be bringing all your Bible stuff over here. I'm like, okay. So I figured out after a while, like, just be Scott. Be their brother. Like, that's all I'm going to be. God will send somebody into their life, whether it's me or it's somebody else or whatever it might be, who will get their attention and be that connection for them. Maybe it's not me. Maybe I'm just Scott because they're like, dude, I remember you before you started loving Jesus, before you started going to church. I'm like, yeah, we're not telling those stories. We're not telling those stories. Not everybody needs to know those stories. We're good. Let's keep rolling because that's the old me. So we've got to realize there is God's job. He already knows where people are. He is already looking after them. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Like He's already working on that. Now, we still need to do our jobs. So if God has put somebody in your life, if they're sitting next to you, if they're in a connection group, men's breakfast, whatever it might be, if they're missing, reach out and let them know that they're missing. It is not my job to do everything in the church. The church is a team sport. Now, somebody leaves... Am I supposed to chase after them? 
Because the one scripture that I always hear over and over again is Jesus left the 99 and went after the one. It's like, that's fantastic. That is also Jesus. Scott is not Jesus. I don't know if you know this about Scott, but Scott likes to speak in third person. And when Scott does, everybody recognizes that Scott is not like Jesus. Like, okay, so I'm like, but maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. So I want to take a second. We're going to spend the rest of our time in Luke chapter 15. If you've got your Bibles, open those things up, pull out some pens. When I heard this teaching years ago, I was like, wow, how have I missed that all this time? Like there's all kinds of stuff. What am I supposed to do with that? So we're going to look into what you're supposed to do with that in um, Luke chapter 15. So this is the parable. We're going to get into three parables. So the parables are just illustrations that Jesus tells using their cultural terms to help them understand a concept that maybe they're struggling with. So in um, Luke chapter 15, and uh, Chris, you're going to keep up with me here for a second. It says, uh, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners in and he eats with them. I like that. That makes me pretty excited, right? Like, I could go hang out with Jesus too. Thank you. Not just everybody who is perfect, which none of us are. So now all of us get to hang out and eat with Jesus. I'm in. Jesus, we're good with that. Verse 3, then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls all of his friends and his neighbors together and he says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. So this is, this is uh, parable number one. There's a sheep that goes wandering off by itself. Now, sheep aren't the smartest of animals. Most of these people that he's talking to grew up around sheep, whether they were the shepherd in their family or their brother or their sister or somebody was the shepherd in their family, they understood sheep. I grew up in the city, not a sheep guy, right? Like, I don't know much about sheep. So I want you to know that these are not the smartest of animals. And what they do sometimes is they just go wandering until somebody tells them to stop. And sometimes they don't get told to stop. But if they were your responsibility and they go wandering off, they are wandering off and, and they don't realize they have wandered off, you need to go get them. So if somebody has broken relationship with you, they've stopped coming to church, they've stopped coming to your family because they're part of your family or your friend group or where you work or whatever context you want to put this in, they might not have just noticed Maybe they got really busy. They, uh, uh, the sports teams came along, family came in, vacation came along. This happens all summer long, and people are like, I was gone five weeks in a row. It's like, I know, we counted. Remember those texts you got? Like, we're keeping up with you guys. But then it's hard to get back in the habit, right? It's hard to start again when you've been sleeping in on Sundays. Like, I get that. Like, that is what it is. But it is my job, it is your job, as somebody who is part of the family, when they go missing... And they don't even realize they've been missing. They're like, I've missed how many weeks? A bunch. How many weeks have I not been in a connection group? A bunch. You know, my life is really struggling right now. Of course it is. Of course it is. You haven't been around all the people doing all the right things, trying really hard in scripture, like all of your good influences. You've stepped away from all of those. I bet your life's falling apart. Come on back. You're good. Just get started again. So there's the first person is one sheep goes wandering off by himself. Then Jesus goes into the next one. This is the parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman who has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and, and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over the sinner who repents. So this place, so the last time, the sheep goes wandering off by themselves. They don't even realize they wandered off. They're like... Yeah, I still go to that church. I have so many people who are like, oh, we go to Catalyst. And they're talking to me the whole time like, you need to come to my church. I'm like, if you don't know who I am, 
you probably don't know the catalyst. Like, isn't that cute? Like some friend invited you one time and, and maybe Richie was preaching or somebody like, if you don't know who I am, you probably don't. So some people just go wandering off and they don't realize it. Some people, you have done something to make them leave. You have said something. You have uh, not kept up with somebody. You have done something. This woman lost her coins. You have done something that has made these people leave. And when those people leave and it is your fault, you go get them. You go chase after them. You show up at their house. You knock on their door. You call them. You text them. You, you take them dinner and you set it outside. You go looking in their windows when they don't know that you are. No, don't do that. No, don't. I'm going to say no to that one. Let's choose that. If any of you have done that, that's the wrong thing to do. Don't do that. You know, get the cops called on you. That will kill a relationship in a second. But seriously, if you've done something wrong, and let me be real clear, all of us have messed this up, right? All of us have said something wrong. We have done something wrong. We have... And sometimes we did it on purpose because we were having a bad day or we're just jerks naturally or whatever it might be. Some of you accidentally said something wrong or didn't do something right or whatever it might be. But if that person is gone because you did something, you go chasing after them. I'm like, okay, that helps me out. And then we have the final, final parable here. And this is the parable of the lost son. This is the one that... Uh, I go to so often. It's like, okay. And then Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided up his property and, uh, between them. So I'm going to give you some context clues as we go along here. In this culture, the dad owned everything. And if the dad did really well, every, the harder you worked, the better you worked, the better name your dad got. And if you were one of his sons... Oh, that boy's good because you know his daddy. Like, mm -hmm, they got their stuff together. But when the only time you get your inheritance is when your dad dies. So when he goes to his father and says, I want my inheritance, he's saying, you're dead to me. I want nothing to do with you. It's like, that would be a tough to hear as a father. Like, that, that might be a tough one, right? So what does his father do? Not long after that, the younger son got together and he had set off for a distant country and he squandered his wealth and wild living. So obviously his father gave him his inheritance. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out as a citizen of that country who, uh, he, who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Now think about this. This is Jesus telling this story. He's telling this story to a bunch of good Jewish people. How do Jewish people think about pigs? Didn't like, Didn't like them. Absolutely against pigs. They don't get to eat bacon. Pass it over here. I'll go ahead and eat it for you. Teamwork. We're making things happen here. So this Jewish person who has avoided pigs all of his life that would see pigs and say, it is sinful to be around them. I am now unclean. I will never go around those pigs. He's hungry. He must be real hungry to go around something he was raised knowing was wrong all of his life. But he hires himself out. In verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. Now, here's some other fun stuff. Like I could go into this stuff forever, so I'm going to look to make sure we get out of here at a decent time. Oh, we've got a couple minutes. So, so as he's doing this... Um, uh, the Romans are in charge of the world at this point, right? So uh, Jesus and his guys spent 80 plus percent in the Galilee. It's this, it's this northern region. This is where we get the Sea of Galilee. You get the Lake of Gennesaret from last week, the Sea of Tiberias. All of it's the same thing, depending upon what town you're from. But what happened is Rome was on the other side, and they started building these 10 cities, these 10 Roman cities who would come in, and they would run the world. They called them the Decapolis. Deca, 10. So they started doing this. The Jewish people hated them so much that they were like, I'm not saying the name. I'm not saying the names of the city. I'm not calling it by the 10 cities. I'm not calling it anything else. What I'm going to call it is 
a land far off. It's like, hmm. Now the Sea of Galilee, it's, I don't know, I don't know how you tell the difference between a sea and a lake, but it's probably right on the border. It's not enormous. Like you can see the other side of it. So as his father is there, he sees him and he goes to a land far off. So he's like, I'm going to run to the Romans. I'm going to go to the place where the people that you hate the most, I don't know why they bother you. I don't know why they, but I'm going to go over there just to make you not like me more, dad. Here, I'm going to put my foot down and I'm going to prove to you that I'm a man. I'm all grown up. It's like, oh, I'm sure nobody in here has ever run into a family member like that, especially when they're teenagers and they know everything. But anyways, um, and then, um, so he realizes this and he decides to go up. And in my mind, he's telling this story. In my mind, he's rehearsing this. I'm going back to my father who I haven't seen in a long time. And the first thing I'm going to say is, I, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And he says, um, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. Make me like, he's just rehearsing. How do I say this best? How do I say this best? This, I'm going to get this right. And I'm going to make sure that my father understands this. And I just want to be part of the family. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his sons and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. How in the world did his father know that he was coming back? He's looking for him. He wasn't too far away. You know, right where your kids are and they're doing something wrong and sometimes you just got to let them do it wrong and it's just wrecking you. Oh, I just hate this. His father knew where he was. He knew to be watching for him and he still had his heart in the right place even though his son came to him and said, you're dead to me. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to make sure that you know, this is generational money. You pass it down from gener. My grandkids, your grandkids aren't going to have anything because I blew all the money. I, I sullied your name. Like there's, no one will think about you the same way. They're like, oh, isn't that the dad that his son left and took the money? Oh, yeah, I don't know what that. And it just spreads like wildfire, right? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you, just like he had rehearsed. And I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick. Now, anytime you see an exclamation point in your Bible, they don't have these in the Greek language. They just, uh, they also don't have bold and underline and italics, so they'll repeat it. But it's a big, like they're yelling at this point. It's important. If you see an exclamation point, recognize that. He says, quick, bring the uh, best robe and put it on his, uh, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. So here's the cultural things going on there. Um, if you were able to make decisions for your household, Remember like you see in like the king things where like they seal it with their stamp? This was a ring. He said, get the ring. You can make decisions for the family. In a second, you are back in. You are part of the family. Get him the ring and get him sandals because slaves didn't wear sandals. You are not a slave. You are my son. You can make decisions for us. You are welcome back in. And he goes on. And he said, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. So they began to celebrate. The fatted calf was one of these things that it wasn't just like, which is the fattest of all the calves? When they were younger, you designated this, the fatted calf, and you put it aside and you made sure that it was treated the best so that you could use it for whatever celebration. It might be a wedding. It might be something like that later on. You treated it differently. You fed it differently. You housed it differently. It was obviously the most important thing. And he said, go get the fatted calf. The fatted calf? Not just a fat calf. The fatted calf. Go get that and bring that because my son was lost and he is found. 
and get the ring and put it on his fingers and the sandals and put it on his feet. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fatted calf. And he uh, has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. How would you feel at this point? Your brother comes and says, Dad, you're dead to me. Give me all the money. And he goes and he blows it all. And what do you do? You wake up the next morning at the crack of dawn and you're back out in the field. And the next morning and the next morning, it's just a grind. And you're doing what a good son does. And you're out there and you're doing all of the right things saying all the right things, being around, making apologies for the family out in the city, in the town that you're in, because your brother was a numbskull, and he went and he ruined the family name, and he ruined the family finances, and all the above, and you come back, and the fatted calf? For this one? No. Like, I'm the good son. Like, shouldn't I be getting the best of this? I'm the one who showed up every day to work and done everything right and has never gone away. I'm the one who's been putting in the work. Shouldn't it be me? I get this. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat that I could celebrate with my friends. Does this... Do you feel like this ever? God, I'm doing every day I'm trying to read my Bible. God, every day I'm trying to pray. Every day I'm trying to have a relationship with you. Be connected. I'm trying every single day and you don't throw me a bone. But these people over here that are living wicked lives, that are just, they're not even trying to have relationships with you. Their life is what I want. I want to have their life. What's wrong with this picture, God? And he goes on. And verse uh, 30, but when his son, uh, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with your prostitutes has come home, you kill the fatted calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because of this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. Like, do you just fear the, hear the father's heart there? Like, I have, all that I've had has always been yours. I did I treat you wrong? Did somehow you not know that everything that I had was yours? Did you think that you couldn't have a goat if you wanted one? Have, have I done something wrong here? To, but I had two sons, and now I have two sons again. You've got the older son who just is self-righteous. And so many times we run into these Christians who are so self-righteous because they have done the right things and said the right things and gone the right places and, and not said the bad things and not gone to the wrong places. And then you have these people who show up just wrecked on Sunday morning or in your connection group or in your life, and they're just happy to be there. Couldn't be any happier. Just thank you, Jesus, for the day you've given me today. So we've got the lost sheep. Doesn't even know they're wandering off. Doesn't know anybody. Spiritually, they're probably an infant. I don't care how long they've been in the church. They're probably an infant. They've wandered off. You've got to go get them. Some people, you've done some things wrong. Because we do these things wrong from time to time. And if you do something wrong, you've got to go get them. And here's the hard one. If they leave on purpose, you wait with open arms and let them return on their own. You didn't do anything wrong. You know that you educated them right. You know that growing up in your house that you treated them right, you taught them right, and they just decided that they were going to leave. You got to let them leave. Now you're looking for them and you're waiting with open arms. And God says that he came to seek and save the lost. I am out seeking, looking for them. I already know where they are. So there's got to be a little trust here that like, God, I know that you're going to do your job. And in this place, 
if, I, if they have walked away and I haven't done anything wrong and it wasn't because of an accident or something like that, I'm going to do my job and I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch for them and I'm going to have open arms and I'm going to welcome them back in whenever they want to come. But I can't go out running after them all the time. I can't be their safety net all the time or they will never be feeding pigs and say, you know what? It was better. It was better at home. So there are some relationships that maybe some of you guys need to look into after this. You guys want to, band wants to come up, the communion wants to get ready. But here's what I want you to know. Like, God knows where they are. God is doing his part. We've got to trust that God is doing his part. And you cannot do their part. As often as you would like to, you cannot keep them from doing whatever you don't want them to do. Or make them do whatever you want them to do. You've got to be there with open arms when they leave. And welcome them back home when God convicts their heart. When God reminds them they're doing something wrong. But this is your job. This is your job as the church here at Catalyst. This is your job in your own family, in your own life. Because here's, here's this, put up this uh, picture here. Here's this thing where a lot of churches look at this. On the one on the left-hand side, everybody is supporting the pastor, and the pastor's doing all the work. The one on the right-hand side is actually scriptural. The pastor is supporting everybody, and everybody is doing all the work. Doesn't that just make more sense? That all of us are watching out for each other, that all of us are caring for each other, that all of us are diving in and helping out when somebody... Doesn't that just make more sense than that's what we pay him to do? Yes, it does. Just logically, it makes more sense. Scripturally, Ephesians chapter 4, it makes more sense. So what are you going to do? Because everyone is called by God. So some of you need to be the person they talk to. You're like, I don't know enough Bible. You don't need to know enough Bible. God says he's got your back. And if you don't know enough Bible, read some more. It's fine. Ask questions of those people around you. They'll help you out. But we know that God is doing his job. The question is, are you doing your job? Because if we do, if we do our job, we know God is doing his job, the world will forever be changed. And you can be a part of changing the world if we can move forward with this. Will you be that person in your family, in your church, at your work? Will you be that person? I'm going to pray and we'll move into our time of communion here. Father God, I thank you for coming after me when I ran away for waiting with open arms as I came back so many times I ask you Lord to break our hearts today for what breaks yours to give us the strength to apologize to ask forgiveness or to walk back in when we have wandered off where we have hurt people Lord, just show your face. Help us to be the sheep that are being chased or be the person who is chasing the sheep, whatever it is you put in front of us. But just make yourself known in all of this. And I pray all this in your son's name.